Okay. <laughs> Welcome to the 12th DAPS Working Group meeting. Today is the 23rd of April. And uh, yeah, let's get right in. So the meeting notes are, I've dropped them in the chat. Um, one thing I wanted to start off with is a little bit of housekeeping. So uh, Luma has uh, stopped supporting these multi-session events. Uh, the cool thing with those was that you could just Back in the day, you could just one click, like uh, RSVP to multiple events. Um, with the new approach, uh, you have to like individually go and like confirm each event. Anyways, I've dropped a, a link to the tag and the tag is basically going to be a stable pointer to uh, the URL in the calendar that shows you just the, the apps working group. Um, once uh, we get the Luma Plus subscription, then we'll be able to send invites to previous attendees. Um, it is what it is. Anyways, the URL is there. Um, you can also, the, the simpler method is uh, you can subscribe to the ICS um, in your calendar, and then you'll just get all of the Luma calendar events um, from the community calendar. Sweet. Cool. With that, I thought, I don't know, maybe we can do like some status updates. Uh, if there's anything that we want to discuss in particular um, and, and start off with like the foundation on top of which we build everything. So that is uh, Helia. Um, Alex, do you have anything you want to discuss or share? I know that there's like, you've been churning out quite a few uh, PRs, some bit swap stuff, routing stuff. Yeah, I guess we, um, so I shipped, uh, yeah, bit swap sessions along with some fixes over the weekend. Um, session shipped last week, so the fixes were over the weekend. Um, and then I spent some time benchmarking it and I talked about that on our, or yesterday. Uh, but the, the good news is the, uh, the Helio benchmarks are looking very favorable. Um, which is lovely. I'm actually now looking at the performance of the different transports relative to each other to see if there's uh, anything like outstanding, like anything obvious, any outliers there. Um, I'll probably share that later. Um, yeah, all good. Do the benchmarks uh, run both in, in a browser and in Node.js? Or is it? I just Node at the moment because they just run TCP. Um, but the right. idea of expanding it to use different transports is then we kind of like build up our scaffolding to um, run, you know, anywhere we like. Also, the running it, like setting it all up so we can run it in browsers as well would be good because it means we run it out of process, which means we then like need some kind of HTTP RPC endpoint or something like that to hit Helio from a different process with, which will then kind of, there was a, there was a, a caveat that the, the Helio stuff is run in process and the Kubo stuff is run out of process. So there's a little bit of overhead to, to account for making a HTTP request, then Kubo doing its thing and then sending the data back. But it's all local and HTTP is pretty well debugged. It's quite performant. Um, you you might have heard of it. <laughs> so uh, I don't think it's going to be a huge amount of uh, overhead, uh, certainly not enough to account for the difference in the benchmark. Um, but it also, if we run Helio in the same way, then it will just, you know, it will uh, remove that from the equation. And what you said there about different transports, do you mean like, did you mean just like setting up the foundation so that we can test different transports or, because I mean, right now, as you said, right, Node.js is like pretty much just TCP. Uh, and WebRTC and WebSockets. Um, but yeah, it's just a case of just shelling out to, you know, playwright test or something like that to just set up an easy headless browser environment and just running the same things in there. Cool. Anything else? I think that is everything. There's the PR. There was the PR. Um, I just saw this morning about the the sessions with trustless gateways. Do you want to speak to that at all, Alex? 
Uh, okay, yeah. So we got so we got bit swap sessions, which you basically uh, you send your request to a subset of peers, um, which massively cuts down on the amount of traffic that you're sending, and also the amount of uh, like lookups that you're doing for providers of those CIDs and that kind of thing. So it'd be really nice to apply the, that same like narrowing of the um, the peers that you're pulling data from to other other block brokers. So the HTTP gateways are one of the other ones that we have. Um, and so we, at the moment, the implementation, we have the, uh, we have the delegated, uh, eight, like delegated routing endpoint that we can use to look up providers of a given CID. We filter them by the addresses that are provided. Um, if there are HTTP addresses provided, then we try to treat those peers as, uh, HTTP gateways. Um, the problem with this is that the, the amount of provider records out there for HTTP gateways is not huge. So you quite frequently end up not being able to find uh, a gateway that, um, that has the content that you want. The thing here being that the gateways actually, they'll go off and they'll fetch the content if you don't, if they don't have them. So we're already like kind of like straying a little bit from the way that the, the gateways are designed to work. Um, uh, and so what we have at the moment with the block brokers is we have a static list of gateways that we, we kind of have a round robin, like hitting at these gateways. We rank them based on if they've like sent us errors or, or whatever. Um, so what, what the PR does is it just, it just creates a new routing that just returns these gateways to have these static gateways. Um, I think in the longer term, when there are more like provider records for, for gateways for things, I think this will get better and we won't need this, but certainly in the interim, just getting the, like the routing to behave a little bit like the, the pre-configured list of gateways, uh, means that we can keep the internal code paths simple because everything uses the same code path. Um, but then it also means that we don't, we don't have to like do something like, you know, one, one, one thing we talked about was like maybe having a timeout and saying, if you can't find the, uh, you know, the content via the routing or HTTP gateway via the routing within this timeout, then we fall back to this default list. But the problem with that is it's going to take ages because we're like, we've got quite a lot of, uh, a lot of the content that we're trying to fetch is if it's not available on these, these, if, if the provider records for the HTTP gateways aren't available via the delegated routing API then we're going to start hitting this timeout load. And if the timeout's like five seconds, like that's a five second delay before your content starts becoming available, which like if that was a website, forget it, like game over. Um, so instead we can just like have this fallback of these routers that we know will fetch the content. We'll know we'll probably fetch the content for us. Um, and then we can just, we can just keep everything nice and the same internally. Cool. So this okay. is the PR515. The add static HTTP gateway routing that mm -hmm. you were talking about. Yeah, and so yeah. we don't need to do anything to like like verify fetch can use it without breaking the API because we already accept a list of gateways and a list of routers and just like if we have gateways we just add them we just add this static HTTP routing to the end of the, the list of routers. No one will ever know it will just start working and. You know, everything get a little bit simpler. Sweet. Yeah, I think, and I think the the HTTP providers not actually having the content is part of some issues that were brought up with IP and I, and like stale providers and different things like that. But, but, yeah, I always thought like the sessions are are great, narrowing like who we talk to to who. Yeah, to like only talk to the people that should have the content is great but like in the con i always thought of gateways still as like this entry point to to ipfs where it w they will go fetch the content if they don't have it um so i thought instead of narrowing the scope in in bit swap terms bit swap session terms like gateways should expand so we have more gateways that can fetch the content and like who's going to fetch it the fastest. And I don't like that's not actually what what is being returned to us is recursive gateways. So we can't we can't guarantee that. 
I mean, the thing is that the, the static gateway could actually also query the routing itself. Right, and it could look for other gateways and then it could add to its list over time and that kind of thing. So like on the Helia side, or you mean the gateway on the server side? I mean the Helia side. You could be okay. trying to find new gateways whenever people do like routing queries. Like the whole the whole idea of this is just to not have these hard coded lists of gateways because right. you know, it's incredibly tedious when things get blocked and we have to do releases and you know, it would be like it would be a lot nicer if the thing could just discover gateways and start using them. It also like it makes the, the P2P people a lot happier as well if they don't see hard coded lists of things. Yeah. So actually in your vision, where would these where would these come? Because I mean I guess the idea is then to convert the currently hard coded ones into more of like a runtime thing that you can fetch, right? But like where yeah, would we so fetch that canonical list? Um well so at the moment we just have this one hard coded routing endpoint. But I mean, there's no reason why we couldn't have like you have to fundamentally you have to bootstrap to the network somehow. Right. Yeah. You have like lib P2P as a list of bootstrap nodes that then uses to find other peers that it then connects to. And suddenly you can disconnect from the bootstrappers. And you know, next time you start, you could reuse the ones that you've been connected to previously, assuming they're still around. So you have to bootstrap yeah. to the network somehow. Like at the moment, we have this, you know, we have like the delegated IPFS link or whatever. Um but it would be really nice if other people would stand up some of these things. Like they're, they're notable because they're not returning us content, they're just returning us metadata. So they should in theory be pretty lightweight to stand up. Um, and you know, less likely yeah, to get blocked. It, by that's a good call out. Like how do we make it, how do we announce to people, you know, this easy thing they can just run as a sidecar or whatever. Yeah, Dietrich just asked but Specifically that. in this case, there's a distinction right between the recursive and the non-recursive the ones that were hard coded are recursive like do we have any thoughts about like does this require any spec changes because the delegated routing endpoint still expects you to pass a sid um so like have you thought about uh how you would get this because if, if it is a runtime thing where you just make a call to the like to the um delegated routing endpoint is this like a new path in the delegated routing endpoint or to discover more uh gateway yeah i mean like so uh, it, we can end up doing it the same way that we discover uh circuit relay servers so there's a there's a magic cid that everyone knows ahead of time that you publish a provider record for and once you find providers of those of that particular CID, then you have found circuit relay servers. Um, because they're you know they're running the circuit relay service, that's where they publish the CID. So if you had a similar CID saying, hey, I am a recursive HTTP gateway, you could look up that CID and then you get a whole list of 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 uh of gateways back. That would be awesome. Also, potential place for people to start spamming and for all the malicious actors to s discover people they can abuse, but but <laughs> would be very useful for other people as well. Yeah, I, I also wasn't aware of this. Two things that just stand out, thought I'd, I'd bring up. Uh, the first is, first of all, like, so, so if you're just a lead P2P host, do you also publish like provider records? for the circuit relay stuff like I, I was just not aware of that at all if you have well with js if you've configured the circuit relay server then and you've set it to publish its availability then yes um, i think go does it by default uh, but you have to configure it with js and I, I guess that means that if you're doing any kind of circuit relay then you need to like have also the the demo of like dht module in your like lib p2p implementation well you need you need some content providing routing system 
So the delegated HTTP endpoint is one. Kademina is another one. You need one. Right, right. As it's abstracted now also in like Helia with the routing interface, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I guess the second thing is, uh, and this is a bit of an open question for you, um, uh, Lidl. Remember how we were debugging some problems with the delegated routing endpoint and how some guy, because it's not like doing, I, I can't remember the, the fine details of it, but the problem that we were seeing was that uh, we weren't getting some of the multi-adders. And that is because of how like peer routing and like peer discovery is a bit of an implicit process in, um, in Kubo. The, do you have any update to share there about at least what's the state of the problem and if that has any sort of downstream implications for us as we consume it? Yeah, so there's like, um, there are two legs to that story. Uh, and maybe like I start with a link uh, if you could add it to, uh, to notes. Um, right now, the way some guy works it's uh, it's it, it it does not do any extra work on top of uh, what regular Kubo node did routing wise, um, and it actually like does less, in a sense. So, in um, if you have a Kubo based uh, let's say gateway or a node, and you want to retrieve a content, you do the routing first. You find uh, that this peer ID as uh, that uh, is a provider for that content. And then you want to retrieve that content. So you actively uh, find uh, that peers uh, multi-other and you connect to it. You learn about the protocols it supports. It's usually bit swap and you retrieve. And ev on every step of that, so first is content routing. You learn that this CID is provided by this peer ID. Then there's like a peer routing step where you learn about addresses of that peer ID. And then you connect to that peer and you learn about the protocols on each like stage. You learn more and more about the peer. And you kind of like have a local peer uh, like store for that information. So if you need to fetch other CID from that peer, you already have that information. Uh, and it's cached locally, and you just directly ask them. Maybe you even have a connection to them already. When it comes to like some guy, which is a standalone routing service, it just kind of like stops at the first step. So who has this CID? And it asks IPNI and DHT, and it gets information back, um, and that's it. So if it, it may know multi others if it was like return from IPNI at CID.contact, or if it learn about the actual addresses before by maybe someone asks for uh, like did peer lookup for that peer ID before, and we learn the multi others and we'll cache them. So then we will start returning them with uh, the, the content routing endpoint responses. Uh, but some guy does not do any like proactive uh, like checks, it does not learn more about peers. It just gives you the bare minimum it has as fast as possible, especially in the streaming responses. So the issue I linked is kind of like about like adding more active probing to some guy, make it more useful. Uh, because you, you mentioned that, oh, we return a lot of peer IDs without any addresses. So that's for two reasons. One is it may be just we'll see this peer ID for the first time. Uh, or maybe we, we've seen it like multiple times, but we never had to like, we never did any interaction with DHT that made us learn its uh, multi others. Um, so one idea is to kind of like, we have a list of those peer IDs in the local store asynchronously. We could be like, some guy could be probing them, learning about multi others, maybe learning about protocols. And that way you can like immediately uh, return more useful information to the browser users. Um, and, the, and, and the second thing is, uh, in recent Kubo, Kubo 20, 028, we uh, started like filtering out uh, less useful multi others So for example, like we don't no longer return uh, LAN, like private uh, IP ranges on the uh, public uh, DHT and also on the local network uh, DHT, we don't return loopback uh, addresses. Uh, 
because they effectively were not useful and they just like added additional bytes to responses. So it could be that in the past we those peer, peers uh, that were are now empty, they have no addresses, they only had like local addresses uh, that you were not able to use anyway. Uh, so those are like two answers and sorry if it was kind of like too long, but that's kind of like just to show that it's like, it's not really a bug in like some guy, it's more about the fact that we've, uh, historically everything was in Go IPFS and we now we are like extracting pieces of it to different libraries and we build services and now the services like some guy not only maybe like a regression in functionality that it does not do some behaviors happened implicitly and now we need to like explicitly do this active probing so there's like an issue where if anyone wants to like track and or has ideas how we should be like building reputation over time because now we can like do more useful things for the routing not like we could gather more information we could be tracking the uh, health of peers over time um and you know on the on the streaming return addresses immediately if it's not a stream response maybe we would uh, leverage additional uh, like health and so like return more online uh, ones uh, faster but yeah that's that's the landscape and uh, in general, uh, yeah, it impacts uh, it impacts browsers uh, browser users the most uh, because you know every millisecond matters. And if we are able to return multi others immediately, we avoid uh, this additional lookup. Uh, but yeah, that's that's the state. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to uh, reply to Dietrich. So Dietrich, you asked why not bundle with stuff we deploy. Um, so two things, first of all, we do deploy the delegated, like we deploy some guy as a delegated routing endpoint that we host in the public utilities. Um, not sure if you were aware oh. of that. Let me clarify. Why don't we bundle it with things that when people install IPFS, they become. So yes, we do. We do. That's, okay. That was the cool. second thing. Um, so, I mean, you can deploy obviously some guy on its own and it'll just be the delegated routing endpoint, but now Kuba also supports this as a uh, thing that you can enable with a flag, um, which is pretty uh, cool. But, it, but it's, it's not enabled by default. So it doesn't, you'd have to flip it on in your config. Yeah. We were, just talking, about, like, I, we were talking about HTTP uh, gateways at the time when you when you stuck that in the chat. Because um, it has the same problem that WebSockets do, that the user has to have an SSL certificate and a, yeah. and a web server. Otherwise, you know, you can't. You can't access it from browsers and things. So there's like there's additional Excel that the, the user would need to do. Yeah. Yeah, the whole ship Kubo is a functioning uh cert generating HTTP transport supporting uh by default never really went anywhere, even though it just I'd seems rather, like... yeah, I'd rather they just ship WebRTC. That would be rad. Then we wouldn't care about any other stuff. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up, actually, Alex. So I had just a quick question. You you mentioned that WebRTC is already supported by um, uh, by like JS Lib P2P, and I'm curious because I've always found a little bit the naming around all of the different packages for WebRTC, the JS package is a bit confusing. But can you do WebRTC direct, like the sort of the the browser server um, WebRTC? Uh, with no JS, without any TLS certificates today. Uh, so the uh, nomenclature. So we have we have we have WebRTC star deprecated. It's dead to us. We don't talk about it anymore. We have WebRTC direct deprecated. We don't talk about it anymore. It's dead to us. We now have WebRTC and WebRTC direct. So you'll notice we've had two versions of WebRTC direct. So the old one. We don't talk about it anymore, but the, in brief, like, so with WebRTC, you have to do a handshake first. Um, when you're doing your handshake called SDP, uh, session description protocol, and you're just saying, hey, I'm on this port and I speak these, uh, like I want to speak data channels and I'm on this port, like let's be friends. And then if you're, you want to talk to the same protocol and you connect the same port, you can do the handshake and you move on. Um, so the difference between all the protocols is how you do that handshake. So WebRTC star, we had a WebSocket server that we just send the SDP packets to and we read the response and then we do the do the handshake that way. Um, 
We don't use that anymore because we needed a centralized like, signaling server, this WebSocket server. The original WebRTC Direct, you would start a web server on, on the server side, and then the client would make an HTTP request with its uh, SDP offer. The server would send the SDP response in the response, and then you would do the WebRTC bit after that. Again, you need like you need to stand up a web server, which is no good for us um, because of the reasons, the same reasons as the gateway, you need a domain name, you need a certificate, you need all this to actually do that initial connection. Um, WebRTC, the new version, both WebRTC and WebRTC Direct, instead of doing this handshake via a, a third-party service, we use Circuit Relay. So the first thing, if you want to accept incoming WebRTC connections um, as the WebRTC transport, so that this is for browser, the use case is, is browser to browser. So as a, if you want to accept incoming WebRTC connections as a browser, you first make a relay reservation somewhere and you publish your relay address. And then this, someone who wants to contact you, dials you via the relay, sends an SDP offer, you accept the incoming offer, you send your response, and then you do a, a WebRTC connection independent. The new WebRTC Direct, uh, you do the handshake by crafting a specially, like they call it like like packet like SDP munging. So it's part of the part of the request that you send. There's a field that you can edit in certain implementations of WebRTC, which you can use to send like enough of your peer information. Like you send the you send the um, you send the fingerprint of the certificate that you've generated as part of your offer, which the remote can then read and then contact you and then send the response, and then you can do the handshake and and all right. So the problem here is that not all the implementations allow SDP header munging. So the the uh, the one that Go uses the one that Rust uses both support it. The one that um, like lib data channel, it seems like it would be more complicated than the maintainer is willing to entertain to add this particular feature. Um, so no, you can't do WebRTC direct in, you cannot, you cannot listen on WebRTC direct in node. You can, in theory, you should be able to dial it um, because it's part of the, uh, part of the, the API, the documented API that we're using to do the munging, we should be able to uh, dial WebRTC Direct from Node, but it's not implemented. Um, mostly because if you're dialing a WebRTC Direct server, you're dialing a server, and if you're in Node, you'd probably dial using TCP. So it's faster. So there's not there's not a lot of benefit to be gained from implementing um, WebRTC Direct in Node. Uh, what WebRTC in Node does support is the private to private version. So the browser to browser. So no, in Node.js, uh, you can get a reservation on a relay and then a interested party can dial you via that relay um, and you can create a WebRTC connection that way. And of course you can also do the same to dial a browser from Node. So the browser can get a relay reservation and then Node can dial the browser via the relay and then do the WebRTC handshake directly. Does that answer your question? sort of lost you a bit at the end but from what i understand basically um i guess my main question is the um so, so if node.js basically you can dial a browser uh via reservation so so sorry a browser can initiate a connection to you creating a reservation like uh, assuming that you are a node.js you can be a, a circuit relay v2 um, peer that a browser is able to uh, create a reservation with. Yeah. Yeah. So you can be behind a firewall or whatever, like the classic way of being dialed is like via TCP or WebSockets from Node, but you could be via, behind a firewall and you could have a relay reservation on a public uh, server, a public relay server. And then a browser can dial you behind the firewall via the public relay server, and then you use WebRTC to to punch through the firewall. Right. Like so, in, in like Node can dial browsers, browsers can dial Node, 
but no, the only thing that can't happen is Node can't. And so, and so browsers can dial Rust and Go by WebRTC Direct. The only part of the puzzle that's missing is Node being able to dial Rust and Go over WebRTC Direct and also being able to listen on WebRTC Direct. But it's not really necessary because Node can use TCP to dial uh, Rust or Go. And browsers can use regular WebRTC rather than WebRTC Direct to dial Node. Oh, okay. So no, that's a bit of a surprise. Yeah. I, I guess it's a bit of a surprise that you don't need Web, the new WebRTC Direct for a browser to call Node. So no. So there's so the, the new version of the WebRTC, there's WebRTC Direct and then private to private. So the private to private is the browser to browser version that needs a relay. So if you dial, so the like so Node.js can also listen on a relay. As a as a private to private node, like using the private to private version of the WebRTC trans. So it uses the same mm -hmm. mechanism mechanism as the browser. Okay, I'm gonna just let that sink in. Probably rewatch this video a couple of times. Let it settle on, on half speed. The problem is all the words are the same. But we have, I don't know. Should I, should I go for it again? Say again. Should I go through it again? So we have web RTC direct. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. the use case and vision here was was browsers dialing servers. Right. And it's it's a it's point to point. It requires no no external service. And then we have WebRTC private to private. The use case and vision was browsers to browsers, and it requires a relay server to do the initial handshake. After the handshake's done, the browsers have a direct WebRTC connection between them. Like you can shut down the relay after the connection has been established, and then the browsers are, are happy talking to each other. So Node has implemented private to private. Go has implemented WebRTC Direct. So has Rust. And WebRTC private to private is coming in Go, but not in Rust. Or at least I don't think yeah. anyone's working. And so with private to private which is implemented in Node.js, allowing a browser to connect to Node.js without a certificate, but mm -hmm. using uh, a circuit relay reservation, right? Yeah. And to create that circuit relay reservation from a browser, there needs to be a TLS certificate or that's unnecessary? Uh, you need to be able to dial the the relay somehow. So Okay. To but you don't you don't have to you don't have to mess around with TLS certificates at the browser API level. So behind the scenes, um, a certificate is generated by WebRTC, but it's transparent to the user. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, like, if you're gonna dial like a, a relay, then you need to somehow dial that relay. And if it's like a long running service, it would need to have a TLS certificate. Yeah. Well, it needs to be I listening mean, on secure web sockets or you know something else. I mean, can in dial. theory, could it be web transport too in the future? Yep. yep, absolutely. Okay. And then basically this private to private would enable this whole also hole punching. So it's like you create the reservation. That's There's no hole punching there. You're just di dialing essentially a direct server. Uh, once you've established a connection, someone else can actually dial your browser through that Node.js um, server. If you if it's running a relay, yeah. So you can accept incoming connections if you have a relay reservation, and then you so then you end up with a multi adder that contains the relay information, and then all the connections go via the relay, and then if it's a WebRTC connection, after you've got the connection open via the relay, it negotiates a a direct WebRTC connection between the two peers, and then it does also the the hole punching through that relay like the relay uh, is 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 that coordinating the decutter 
that hole punching process? Uh, no. So it just uses WebRTC's built-in hole punching. Okay, which relies on these, is it turn servers or ice? Yeah, uh, or... stun and stun and turn. Stun. Stun. Okay. And these are configurable. Like these are actual, like there's a lot of mm -hmm. public ones that are given for free. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know if anyone who's already leveraging this in like the JS stack? Because it seems like it's really useful. And I think it was already it's like so getting pretty useful. far with it. This is the stupid, this is the this is the peer-to-peer -peer bit. This is the bit we've been working at for years. This is the one. Where RTC is gonna make it happen finally. Yeah, but I mean, um, like if you look even at the universal connectivity app, like it's sort of almost leveraging it. I mean, it has the trouble of like discovering the multi-adders because like we don't have a an out-of-the-box building block for that. But it's like almost there. And like I had trouble with like the last 10%, quite significant trouble of like just wrapping my head around like what's going on. And it works well enough if you have like a, 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 a sorry, a Rust and um, like a Go peer because they will just relay the PubSub messages. So you don't really care too much about establishing those direct connections, but they're obviously necessary if you want to start really moving bytes around rather than just PubSub messages. Yeah, I mean, it would be, I haven't looked at the University Connectivity app for a while, but, it, you know, because it was using its own, like, its own DHT and, and all this kind of thing. Um, it like should, this should be now. I guess I haven't looked at it for a while, but there, yeah. there, I mean, there should be enough, there should be enough, uh, like, public relay servers that you should be able to, just use it should just work on public on the public network but the, the the problem has always been obviously like like it will work in firefox really nicely now chances are because firefox is great web transport support now because like what, what normally happens is you so you dial the relays and then because you because the browser has you know it has web sockets and it has web rtc like if you're in chrome like web transport still doesn't work properly so you dial the relay over over web sockets you do like a query you get a bunch of addresses back and then you can't dial anyone and then sad face. Like if you're lucky, you'll dial the relay, you'll dial the, sorry, you'll dial the bootstrappers and the bootstrappers will run relay nodes. So if you're really lucky, you'll dial the bootstrappers and you'll get a relay slot on one of the bootstrappers that you just dialed. And then you're dialable because then you can suddenly you have a, a relay address with the WebRTC bit on the end. And then you can, you can tell your friend that and then they'll, they can dial you via the relay. Um, what what is what will be what is better is in Firefox you'll do that initial like peer lookup. It's also worth noting that you could do this peer lookup via the delegated uh, routing API, like the delegated routing HTTP API server as well. You don't need to connect to the bootstrappers, but you'll you, you you'll have the same problem for the most part. And that you'll you know you'll dial it and then you won't you won't be able to dial any of the peers. But now in Firefox, by now hopefully the WebRTC support in the network has grown enough that you've got a reasonably decent chance of doing that that lookup for that magic CID uh, via via the delegated HTTP routing API and finding a peer with a web transport address, which you can then dial, get a reservation, and then bang, you have a you have a circuit relay address that people can dial you via WebRTC. That's the magic. And in this case, the magic CID uh, identifies which nodes, nodes that have web transport and the circuit relay. Relay, circuit relay. So so if you're a circuit relay server, you will publish a provider record yeah, yeah. saying, I can provide the content for the CID. Um, and that will get, that will go like through the network. Like you will look up the 20 closest peers, but you'll, you know, you'll, that's fine. They will get the provider record. But then as you're, as someone is looking for that CID, you will, you will query these, these different peers and they will say, oh, well, I can provide this CID because yeah. they're also, they're a relay server. So they're like, here you go, I'm a provider. Here's the provider record. And they're like, great, you're a relay server. I'm going to try and dial you and, and try and get a relay reservation. So like, so the people looking up the relays, their query chances are will never make it to like all the way to the end um, because they will find peers along the way that, that are providers of the CID. What is that CID? Is that like documented? One, is that two, like in the circuit? Three, four. I don't know. I think it's in the, I don't know off the top of my head. It's in, it's, uh, 
that it's in the spec. It's definitely it should be. If it's not in the spec, it should be in the spec. It's in the spec. I'm gonna say it's in the spec. That's the one. Uh, Russell has kindly posted a link in the chat. To anyone watching along at home who doesn't have the chat, the link is HTTP <laughs> slash slash. <laughs> All right, cool. Cool. Um, thanks uh, for uh, sharing all those insights. Maybe hopefully like in the near future, we can spend a bit more time, especially as like the whole topic of like direct peer to peer retrievals becomes a bit more salient. Um, I feel an IPFS camp talk brewing on this. Cool. Um, verified fetch. Any updates there? Besides, we had the blog post. It's out. We're going to do a deep dive at the Andres gathering. Uh, the Dash incubator. Also, they want me to come on, uh, talk a little bit about IPFS and stuff and uh, retrieval. I was like, hold off. We've got to get this release and all of the materials around it. And then uh, I'd be happy to go on. So that, that's maybe going to be next Monday. Um, but um, yeah, I thought like... Uh, uh, if we have any updates to share, I think this is, uh, or, or anything to discuss here. I mean, I saw we, we have like the duplicate blocks and the pending stuff uh, going. That's really nice. Thanks, uh, Russell. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, I mean, mostly the alpha milestones are are done. Um, maybe we can rename those to better as we discussed as a team earlier this week uh, or yesterday. I don't know. Last week, last Thursday. Um but um yeah the the only other thing really is the error pages and there's probably some discussion that we can have around like how we want to surface those errors up from verified fetch uh Lytle and I chatted a, a little bit about that um but the the stack like the way that we implemented verified fetch and have done everything so far is that it's based like the fetch API and so the fetch API you know it almost always returns a response unless there's some error and it throws um, in the construction of the response or the URL used for the request, et cetera. Um, and so we we try to adhere to that, but then we're also trying to adhere to the um, path gateway IPFS spec, the subdomain gateway IPFS spec. And so there's um, just, there's some different issues. And so I think one unique problem that this like useful error page ran into is like, how do we actually surface the, the stack trace from errors? And I think Kubo and, and Rainbow and others have run into a similar problem as well. Like how do we actually from the gateway return an error that's got the full trace information? Um, and I don't think that's well-defined yet. Like, I don't think there's a spec around it. And I think that would be useful even, even if we maybe don't have the bandwidth to fully nail that down now, but, um, for verified fetch, we need to come up with some decent solution. I think Lytle and I have one where we can just um, like in in some cases, the body that comes from the verified fetch response, which has the status code of the like spec compliant status code, but then the body has an actual stringified version of the stack trace. Um, yeah, that's going to probably be the solution we go to there but that's the last thing remaining for verified fetch um alpha besides the infinite uh redirect bug which i i finally have like an ipfs hosted like locally running server um which is working and i've got an end to end test failing for the infinite loop bug so um should be able to get that solved and then we can actually test locally against the ipfs hosted deployed version instead of just static website deployed at a you know um the host version or deployed folder whatever um so yeah like there's there's been a lot of progress in verified fetch lately and um i mean 
also Alex has been a lot of fixes have come from from Alex and H Helia HTTP gateway, which is super cool. And I don't think we've um, talked about those benefits that were done under the hood and seen in Helia HTTP gateway. I don't think we've talked about those benefits coming to service worker gateway, but you know, it's the same code underneath. So should like all the improvements should really help in service worker gateway a ton too. I'm really excited to get this bug fixed and um, with our gateways working really well now for the in browser TLD um, should be, should be in a really good state. I'm hoping for, for Thursday so we can maybe even like show, show some of it for the ingress gathering. I think it's great to be um, hitting this stuff from multiple angles as well, even though the angles are I would say slightly, only slightly different from each other, but um, using it in different contexts and like dog fooding it probably. Yeah. Is that like verified fetch being both in the service worker gateway and in the HTTP gateway that you're referring to? We say like a lot of the fixes, like the, the problems are being like surfaced in the HTTP gateway and in the service worker gateway. And then fixed to the Helia layer and then like finesse to the verified fetch layer and like that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah totally. think... One other thing that came I, that I think we should talk about Alex is the, the metrics that you started to expose on the Helia on Helia. We didn't actually touch on that, but um, I don't know if that PR is merged, but um you know, we've got a Helia HTTP gateway has a Grafana dashboard that Alex has uh, used for improving things. I'm, I'm going to push on him again now to to <laughs> merge that into Helia HTTP gateway so we can all benefit from that. But like there wasn't a blessed sort of Grafana dashboard for libp2p. And I think this this can be that. And then also for Helia and like it's a really good place for people to to like build from for debugging their deployed Helia. Yeah, I want to get back onto that later this week or perhaps early next week. Cool, sweet. Because I want to get like, so what, so what we did was we added, um, we exposed like a metrics key on Helia itself, uh, which is just the, the regular libp2p metrics object, which is optional, so it doesn't have to be enabled. Um, and then we can just write arbitrary metrics into it. So like, at the moment, we only really connect, we collect metrics at kind of the lib P2P level and the bit swap level. Um, you can obviously add metrics about like the runtime itself. Um, but then also it'd be lovely to expand that to other things. So like, like the routing system, like which routers are fast, which routers are slow, like what's the IPNS lookup looking like, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Like, Show, like, can we benchmark individual IPNS like servers? Not like benchmark, but can we like can we track metrics on them and all this kind of stuff? Um, so that's all that's all become unlocked by by having a like a globally available uh, metrics implementation. And also, then you know, like it's not it's not also just relevant for servers as well because you remember there was that that uh, web transport demo page that hooked into the lib P2P metrics thing in the browser and was generating nice graphs. Um, that we then used to to demonstrate bugs to like, the Chromium team and that kind of thing. So, you know, it, it benefits browsers as well as as well as servers. I think we're getting very close to a point where we can do like a Helia UI, um, like we could have before too. But um, I think it would be extremely useful now. Like it could be built. So anybody watching that's trying to think of projects to build. Um, that would be a beautiful, beautiful thing. <laughs> GraphQL is a programming language, so yeah, sure. <laughs> cool. Um, I thought one last thing to flag is that we uh, have published like and announced that we have this Helia survey, the feedback survey that um, I've sort of created uh, with, um, a, what's it called? Um, a, um, Airtable. Yeah. So it's an uh, Airtable. It, it goes to Airtable and we get notifications for it. So far, we haven't actually been able to get any data, which is, I think, there, but uh, I think we'll we'll try to make uh, um, 
it visible through either the repo and like uh, just try to you know get people who are like exploring it to engage with us so that we can get some of that feedback um that's uh it from my side um there's nothing else i think we can wrap up um um maybe more for offline but um i did see two notifications for the survey did um i think two separate ones did those not save or were they just not as about not quite the information we were looking for yeah so actually we got one the other one was just uh i asked dame to fill it out um okay but I'll make sure that you uh, both, uh, all of you have access so that you can see the results. Um, cool. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks for setting that up too. Yeah, that's going to be, that's if we can get some feedback on that, that'd be super cool. So definitely we should be announcing that at the interest gathering too. Yeah. And uh, I think before we end, there's like one fun meme I'd like to share. <laughs> which i'm going to be using uh dietrich is for, excited uh, can you see that nice yeah so i think i think that's a pretty good way to just present the roadmap that we're now with like multi-gateway retrieval and then this is kind of like our northern star we'd like to get to do you guys think it's fair? I'll take that as yeah. a yes. All right. Yeah. Just one web RTC. Yeah, I like it. Cool. I, I like the idea of mapping the meme to uh, the actual blocking issues for each one of those. Like, actually use the meme as a roadmap. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, I, I'm losing my train of thought. I was going to say something. I can't remember. I lost it. Oh, service worker gateway. Yeah, we um, so we're or Helia verified fetch. We just used the trustless gateway, like Helia HTTP. And I feel like we, I mean, we could probably, I want to, well, maybe we need to polish it more, but I really want to test enabling more P2P there. Um, I don't think it's going to give us a ton right now with web transport, but um, especially in like Chromium, but I think, yeah, with WebRTC like that, we just enable P2P and verified fetch and we'll be looking pretty good. Anyway, that's it. So if I looked at sit up in the delegated routing endpoint, I should be able to find loads of different nodes. Oh yeah. Actually not that many. Talking about the circuit relay V2, Sid? Yeah. And I assume it's the right one because I reverse engineered the JS code and just generated the same CID for the same string. <laughs> but there are some results, so at least some people made the same mistakes I did. <laughs> uh, the one with addresses is listening on a circuit really, address. Yeah, but I agree it should be uh, it should be part of the spec. I did not see that in in the spec, so. Cool. Um, yeah. Uh, see you at the next uh, session. As I mentioned, um, like there's a new link for the event because we don't have recurring events and uh, we still can't invite because we don't have Luma Plus. So uh, just make sure you like check out the calendar and subscribe to uh, future DAP working group events.
See you around. Ciao.